In today's talk, I want to discuss where T2 contrast comes from on MR imaging. This is something that I think we take for granted on the images, but I think if you can understand the source of the contrast, you'll have a better appreciation for uh, how things can go wrong. I'm gonna use some of the concepts uh, I used last week, that is the rotating frame of reference, and uh, this idea of looking at net magnetization of the protons. So if you didn't have an opportunity to see that last week, I'd suggest you go back to that one. But basically these three axes, the one in yellow is the uh, axis along the main magnetic field, represent the longitudinal orientation of magnetization. And this is the transverse plane where we want the net magnetization to lie so that we can pick up the signal from the rotating protons. And again, the frame, this frame we're indicating is uh, turning at the same uh, rate as the uh, net magnetization. So if we look at CSF and brain, and we're gonna pretend they have about the same proton density, which is really not far off. So at rest, they, the magnetization vector for each one should be about the same. Then we use a 90 degree pulse. So we put energy into the system and we displace that net magnetization into the transverse plane. Again, in a rotating frame of reference, I don't have to draw this as rotating. I just know that this is, uh, this is moving at the same rate as the uh, axis. So now we have these protons in the transverse plane and we can use an antenna to pick up the signal induced in the, in the wire. Um, now, the CSF and brain look about the same. So where does the contrast come from? And this is where we come back to these pulse diagrams. So it is not in the static state where we look at differences in signal. It's what happens dynamically as the radio frequency pulses interact with the tissues. So when we give one 90 degree pulse, we follow it with a, in a simple spin echo experiment. We just follow that with a 180 degree pulse. And at this point in time, which is the TE time or time to echo time, this being half of TA, TE, right? Where the 180 degree pulse is, that the distance between the 90 degree pulses we can modify. And this is the TR time, the time to repetition. By making that time uh, short, we can influence T1 but by modifying the time where the 180 degree pulse lies, we can either increase or decrease the distance from the initial 90 degree pulse to the echo. With T2 weighted imaging, we're looking for images that have a long TE time. T1 weighted imaging, we generally look for images that have a short TE time. Now, what happens in that, in that time after the 90 degree pulse, when the protons first come down, they're in phase, right? This is a homogeneous state. But it, very soon, the spins start to drift off in the transverse plane. That's the nature of T2 dephasing. Or in that time, we describe it as T2. And that's intrinsic to the tissue. CSF has a long T2 relaxation time. Brain has a shorter T2 relaxation time. So eventually these spins will dephase and sort of arrange themselves in this fashion where you get, in a sense, no signal back when you listen with an antenna because we've lost that phase coherence. The closer these stay together, the more, the more phase coherence we have, the more signal we're going to get. But that's not really what I want to address in this talk. But, but you have to understand that it takes a longer time to lose phase with CSF than it does with solid tissue like the brain. So what happens after the 180 degree pulse, and, and you may have seen this uh, in running track analogy, but, but just to reiterate it, because I think it's really so good and, and it's so relevant in this situation. So if we have a starting line, we fire, we fire the starting gun and the runners go around the track that we see that one, this runner is fast and this runner is slower. Now, what the 180 degree pulse does, it's as if we fired the gun to return back. And so with that situation, the fast runner in theory will be just as fast and the slower runner will be just as slow and they should arrive back at the starting line at the same time. So this is the, the essence of the rephasing of the spins. So they start to 
uh, dissociate, and then they come back together in that, uh, in that period of time that we call the spin echo. But because of this property of more rapid dephasing, we lose some of the spins along the way. It's as if you, know, you have a, a, um, a group of individuals and you tell everyone to stay together uh, and, and stay together for the next hour or two and a few drift off. So we have some of these spins that drift off because of the more rapid dephasing. So when we pull the spin echo back together, we're gonna have more spins to generate signal in the CSF than we do in the brain. And so in the imaging, that's what we see. We have more signal arising from the CSF than we do in the brain. And when you describe T2 weighted imaging, I, I would recommend that you use terms not hyper intense or uh, you know, bright on the T2 weighted imaging. If you, if you just describe it by what it is, is that we have an area of T2 prolongation here. We have an area of short T2 relaxation time. Then I think it gets you in the frame of mind of understanding where the signal is coming from. In this case, because it's a long TR sequence, that we have very little effect from T1 effect, but uh, to get a T2 weighted image, we have a long TE time, which allows the brain to lose phase coherence. We get less signal from the brain and then relatively more signal from the CSF. So that's where T2 weighted contrast comes from on MR imaging. Now, at this point in time, I just want to introduce this notion of, of you may be asking yourself, why am I learning this? Why doesn't he just show me some cases that I'm going to see in my practice or I'm going to see on my boards and so on? The reason I, I want you to learn MR physics is it's going to help your patients. It helps your patients because you'll have fewer reports with false positives. And these are not trivial. Flow ghosting that looks like a metastatic lesion. Uh, something that you think is uh, an area of enhancement when it's really T1 shortening for a different reason. Uh, and so all of these things that you may uh, report erroneously, these false positives, you may think, well, they come back and we do a scan and we show that it's nothing, no harm done, but there is harm done. You've worried the patient, you've cost them money because nothing is free anymore. Uh, we, don't, we certainly don't give them a buy on the follow-up scan. And they take, oftentimes take time away from their family or their work. So again, this is not, it's not a, a, a nothing for the patient. And the other thing is it's going to uh, help you improve the production of images. When you find yourself in a situation where you're responsible for a scanner, you can explain better what it is that you need or what you're seeing uh, to the staff. Uh, you may have suggestions on how to change it, but the more you understand of the production of the imaging, the better the chance you have to get optimal imaging for your patients. And in the end, I think you'll have greatest fact, dissatisfaction in your work. I just want to show you a couple of cases where this came up. Like this is a patient, now again, this has been a while, but same principle, here's a flare scan. Now we know on flare imaging that the cortical cell size should be dark. And if you look in this case, the cortical cell size are not dark. And so in this patient who may have a history of headache, you might suggest the possibilities of subarachnoid hemorrhage or meningitis. And the next thing that the patient will get, usually when you say that, is a spinal tap. But if you look at the scan, you'll notice that the ventricles are also dark. So even though this is billed as a flare scan on the PACs, you know there's something not quite right about this. How could the CSF be abnormal in the cortical cell site and the ventricles? If you keep in mind the physiology here, the ventricles are in a sense upstream and the cortical cell site are downstream, meaning the CSF is produced, you know, whether it's from the brain or the choroid plexus, starts in the ventricles, flows down out through the fourth ventricle around the spinal cord, and then is resorbed over the convexity. So for all of these spaces to be abnormal and flare is very unusual and would imply something that's both intraventricular and uh, in the subarachnoid space and without any fluid, fluid levels. So knowing this is suspicious, you go and you talk to the technologist and you say, hey, what, what imaging parameters did you use? And they say, oh, we use this other protocol. We don't usually use it. And say, well, why don't we use the regular protocol? So same patient, like whatever, five minutes, seven minutes later, it looks completely normal, right? Cortical cell sire are suppressed, ventricles are suppressed. This is just because they, in this case, they picked the wrong TR time for the flare scan. So the more you understand the imaging, the better the chance you have to create reliable images. 
The other thing, this is a recent case we had. This was a patient who uh, had maybe headaches. And you notice that there's this space behind the cerebellum that is a very high signal intensity on the flare scan. Say, this is just the adjacent slice. And you see the complete suppression of CSF here in the interpinuncular cistern and along the sylvian fissures and cortical sulci and so on. And that should lead you to think, well, this is not CSF because look, it's not suppressing like CSF elsewhere. One of the possibilities you should consider in the posterior fossa, usually in the CP angle cistern, but possible in this location, would be an epidermoid. So we go to the diffusion scan, and look, it doesn't have restricted diffusion. But now you notice these giant artifacts, right? We're not seeing anything up here. So these are artifacts from braces. So this is a young patient, had braces on. And so this became an indeterminate finding. We weren't, you couldn't be 100% sure that it was abnormal. But at the same time, you had a feeling this was an artifact. So the patient came back, and they took the braces off. And this is what that area looked like on the flare scan in follow-up. So again, this is what it looked like before with the braces, this is what it looks like without the braces. So what we're seeing is this slice, even though we don't see the artifact on this particular slice, it was more evident on the lower sections. So because of the way flare imaging is acquired, that is, a, it's a, pre a precision study with precise timing of the 90 degree pulse, the inverting pulse, the 180 degree pulse, and so on that when you have something that distorts the magnetic field, in this case, the braces, you often get this incomplete suppression of CSF. You're used to seeing it in the posterior fossa all the time, uh, if you look carefully for it, in the perimedullary cistern and prepontine cistern and so on. So again, I think the, the more you're aware of the artifacts that occur on the imaging, the more reliable reports you're going to be, and you, and you have the opportunity to make appropriate recommendations in terms of improving image quality and, and in terms of patient management so you don't unnecessarily alarm people or obtain imaging that's really not necessary. Well, that's all, that's all I wanted to talk about today. I'm trying to keep these under 15 minutes. I know you're all busy and uh, I'd be happy to take any questions or if there's anything you want to send to me and by way of a question or something you want me to cover, by all means, get in touch with me. Any questions, comments? No, well, thank you very much for joining me today. I'm going to try to post this one and I've tried to do all of them. Uh, they'll be posted on YouTube on that site, uh, Rad Physics Quarantine University. Hope you have a good evening. Thanks again for joining me.